डॉक्टर शेखर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर कमिंग नमस्कार नमस्कार डॉक्टर लक्ष्मी लक्ष्मी मैम नमस्कार नमस्कार हेलो मैडम वेलकम थैंक यू गुड इवनिंग नमस्ते नमस्कार बोवा नोयची ऑनरेबल गेस्ट इस्टीम्ड स्पीकर्स साइंटिस्ट फैकल्टीज फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द डिफरेंट कॉन्टिनेंट्स स्टूडेंट्स एंड माय डियर फ्रेंड्स अ वेरी वेरी वॉर्म एंड हर्टिएस्ट वेलकम टू वन एंड ऑल I, Dr. Shalini Arya, faculty from Food Engineering and Technology Department, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, India, and on behalf of Indian National Young Academy, INSA, Global Young Academy, and on my own behalf, welcome everyone in third day of this third series of international webinar on empowering women in science, unleashing latent talent. well dear friends we have been discussing for past two days various issues and uh, how women can be uh, brought into science their visibility can be increased and lot many others we uh, issues we have been discussing for past two days regardless of efforts being un undertaken to increase the rates of women in academia by special mentoring programs by various organizations we saw that how owsd or tuas or uh, uh, many other organizations how they are actively involved no matter uh, various indian uh, academies science academies and other organization but little seems to have changed in the recent decades that was you know brought to our notice and yesterday we also saw that it is not the situation in india but also on the internet from the international speaker we saw that the the change is not much uh, in the recent decades and at present it looks like the working environment for female scientists may not hugely change significantly for the better any time soon the gender stereotypes largely remain the same clearly showing that more programs to increase the number of women in sciences are urgently needed and that even further efforts are necessary to change the public image of women in science so the current state might be depressing we have the power to change it the number of women in sciences are increasing and i'm sure that we will have a major impact on the careers of female scientists and scientists to be if we start to massively promote the fantastic work already conducted by them so get involved get out present yourself highlight your achievements and make people aware of good and bad things of the current system so friends why not start right now and it is within this con context institute of chemical technology along with international academy and global young academy are very proud to present this third day of the third series of international webinar titled empowering women in science unleashing the talent and i'm sure we will be able to a very very strong force around the women's participation in various fields through such international discussions understanding the various national as well as international opportunities for the girls and so that they can right time at the right age grab them and uh, it will be also a strong emphasis of dialogue so this will be a uh, there will be a live question and answer session at the end of the talk and from yesterday's presentation professor Ma Yeah, Barbosa has shared her PowerPoint presentation, and I will be sharing that in the link chat box via Google document. Okay, so once again, I welcome our today's speakers and guests, and thank you so much, audiences, for your participation. 
So within this context, uh, today we have with us my very good friend and colleague where we work together in Global Young Academy, Dr. Maha Nasser, who is an associate professor and researcher of pharmaceutics and industrial pharmacy, faculty of pharmacy in Shams University, Egypt. Let me share presentation that I have prepared. So Dr. Maha is a, a member of Global Young Academy. Uh, steering, she's also a member of various international organizations such as Steering Committee member, Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, that is AGYA. Uh, she has received numerous awards and she has been fellow of various international organizations and to name few, Africa Science Leadership Program, one of the very, very prestigious uh, program. And she's a fellow of ASLP, affiliate of the African Academy of Sciences, that is us. She's a young affiliate of the World Academy of Sciences to us. Uh, she's a fellow of Next Einstein Forum, She's a member of Egyptian Young Academy of Sciences. She's also an expert representing in World Economic Forum. She's a body of the African Union Kwame Nukrum Award for Excellence in Life Sciences for Women Scientists of the North African region. And not only this, along with her academic uh, expertise, she's very good in empowering women scientists across different continent. Um, continent. So Dr. Maha Nasser, I'm so grateful to you that you have agreed our invitation and you are here today with us. So thank you so much, Maha, and over to you. Thank you so much, Shalini, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. And it really feels like family in the GYA. So I'm really happy to participate and share my experiences with everyone. And I would also like to thank the audience for being present. And I hope that we can collaborate more in the future and we can be in touch uh, uh, continuously. So um, with your wonderful introduction, Shalini, I will have now to start my presentation. So I will just share the PowerPoint right now. Okay, so is it evident for everyone? So the presentation is clear? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, my talk today is about women empowerment in developing countries, the challenges and opportunities. And why did I choose this topic? Because of all the initiatives that I'm involved in, the women empowerment remains to be my best one and my most preferred one. And then coming from a developing country like Egypt, I want to share the challenges that I have faced, the opportunities that are now present for the women so that they can be empowered in the society and in science in particular. So uh, first regarding my research, I do research in the field of drug delivery and nanotechnology. And in this sense, I have obtained several awards. And I'm also a peer reviewer in like 84 international scientific journals, including those published by Nature and Cell Press. And I've also have like this large collaboration international network with several funding bodies. So whoever sees my research biography or profile, he says, oh my God, she's an academic freak. But then I also enjoy teaching and I really like love my students everywhere in the world. So I have been teaching at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Shams University in Egypt. And this is a picture of me with my students. Uh, I've also been teaching for two years at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Jordan in Muta University. And I also love my students over there. I've also taught a short course on precision medicine at the European Forum Alpach, and this is a picture with my international students in Austria, and a favorite picture of mine, which is a picture with my students in India when I was giving a lecture for a conference at Adamas University. So I just enjoy teaching and I love students everywhere. So it's part of what I do in life. I do research and I also teach and I really interact and take pride in my students everywhere. And then I'm also involved in several international organizations. One of them is AGIA, the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities. 
the other one is the Global Young Academy. And I really appreciate this picture for the Women in Science group, which I'll be talking about later in my slides. I'm also proud to be part of the ASLP family, the Africa Science Leadership Program uh, Fellowship, and also the African Academy of Science as being an affiliate. And I'm also proud to be among the family of the next Einstein Fellows. So I do research, I do teaching, and I'm also involved in many international organizations. So of all the initiatives that I'm involved in, the Women Empowerment remains to be my best one. Because, uh, because of that, I was featured in the Look Women magazine in, uh, in, in Austria uh, as being a successful woman scientist from a developing country. But then uh, it's not the end of the story. I have to tell you the beginning of the story and how did I face the challenges and what are the opportunities that I took and what are the available opportunities which are now present for women to take. So firstly, what did I choose a career in STEM? Uh, as I told you, my field of expertise is in nanotechnology, drug delivery, and pharmacy. So why did I personally choose a career in STEM? Because it's an interdisciplinary field. You are collaborating with different disciplines, and you are really creating something which is really unique. When you are developing formulations or nanoparticles in order to treat diseases, this is a very creative and interdisciplinary field. And till recently, it was just involving men or just little uh, number of females are, were involved in STEM. Uh, another thing why I chose this career in STEM is that, my, is that the research area is directly related to health and it's really like a gift if you can do something which directly benefits the health of the people and the society. So this is really, really uh, a wonderful thing to be doing. And in doing your research and enjoying that, you would, you would also be solving societal problems because if you can increase the compliance of the patient to the therapy and you can decrease the treatment costs with what you are doing and you can achieve like cure or treatment, uh, better treatment outcomes in a short amount of time, then you will be also solving societal problems. But then I realized in me that uh, when I heard a quote at the Africa Science Leadership Program, it was called suffering is actually optional. Suffering is optional. So it really touched me, this quote, because um, I do believe that uh, in terms of uh, health, when you are dealing with the patient um, in his like most vulnerable and weak conditions when he is in a disease state, and you can ease his suffering somehow. This is like one of the greatest gifts that you can give. And this is one of the greatest things that you can be doing in your life. So I was very intrigued to join this career in STEM, but then I faced many challenges. And these challenges are not just personal challenges. You can find them in like most of the developing countries. So the first challenge that I see is the balance between work and life because always the woman has like much more responsibilities than the man because she has to do like lots of tasks. If she's married, she has to take care of the children. She has to take care of the house, the husband and everything. And even if she's not married, the woman is always perceived as a caregiver or care provider. So she's taking care of her family, taking care of her friends, the people in the network around her. So sometimes it's very challenging to balance between work and life. And in this sense, some women just give up. You know, they say, okay, I'm not going to work because I cannot balance everything. So this is actually a challenge because many things are asked, uh, asked of a woman, especially in developing countries. So sometimes she has to give up her work in order to balance other responsibilities. Another challenge, which is really, really very important is that some women, they don't really know that they have it in themselves. And let me give you like a, um, a personal experience. I was attending this Africa Science Leadership Program. And then uh, the organizer of this program, Professor Bernard Slippers, he said when he was lecturing us in this program, he was saying, you know, you are all, you are all here because you are science leaders. But then it really struck me, am I really a science leader? I actually didn't realize that I was a science leader until I attended this program. I thought, okay, this program is wonderful and it gives you skills and it adds to your experiences. But I didn't realize that I was a science leader. And then it made me think, 
well, okay, if I'm a science leader, so how should I act right now? So what should I do in order to, um, to be worthy of the term science leader? So after that, I tried to pay everything forward and I tried to motivate more women to join STEM and to share my experiences because I thought, okay, so I had many responsibilities now because I'm a leader now in science. So I have to convey my experiences and benefit everyone around me. So you see, even myself, I didn't know that I had this strength or I didn't know that I had this trait. So some women, they don't really know their inner strength. And this is actually a very major challenge that they have to work on. Another thing, which is also another important challenge is the lack of the supportive environment. If you like interviewed or asked many of the successful women in the developing countries and you ask them what is the key to your success, they should mention a supportive environment, supportive husbands, supportive parents, because if you yourself are ambitious and you have a will to do something, but then you don't have a supportive environment around you, this is going to destroy everything. So you should really surround yourself with supportive people and try to change the mindset of the people around you so that you can have the supportive environment. Another important challenge is the unfair work rules. And this is something that we see actually in the developing countries very often because the women are uh, always uh, expected in some phases of their lives to have like sabbatical leaves or to have like some sorts of uh, leaves from work, uh, either paid or unpaid to take care of the children. But then when it comes to the assessment, they always perceive the women as of less efficacy than their male colleagues just because they are having these uh, sabbaticals or having this time off work. And this is really not fair because um, if the woman has to take on these responsibilities, this is something that should be appreciated. And uh, on the contrary, it, it's not appreciated. It is perceived as defect in the woman and that she is not giving enough to her work. So this is very unfair. And we are now trying to find laws in order to, um, uh, to um, uh, preserve these uh, um, rights for women at work so that they can have the responsibilities outside work. And at the same time, they are not seen as less worthy than their male colleagues. Okay, then in the developing countries, what's actually missing or what's actually um, present in a little amount? And that's why the women are suffering more. Uh, many of the uh, studies, they have surveyed the three major uh, key keys to the uh, success of the women in developing countries and in countries in general. And they said that the most important three things are three C's. The first C is the cash. You should support the women with the funding opportunities so that she can have the, her initiatives and she can have her um, ideas translated into products, translated into work. She should have sufficient financial support. The second C is the culture. And by the culture here, I mean supportive culture. Supportive culture which uh, fosters the engagement of women in the society and the engagement of the women in um, several activities at work. So if you are having an accepting culture, this is the second C that should be fulfilled. The third C, and this is also very important, is the coaching. And I'll come to this coaching and mentoring at the end of my presentation as a very, very important motive for women to pursue careers in STEM and to empower themselves and to be empowered. So what I mean by coaching is that every woman should have like a role model or a mentor who is, uh, who is guiding her or um, uh, is guide, guiding her on uh, what to do on uh, giving some professional advice and pushing her forward in her career. So the three C's are cash, culture and coaching. These are three important things that should be available for the women to be empowered in the societies. Okay, so do we have like national initiatives for women? Yes, we do. And we have this Egyptian strategy for women empowerment. And it's actually stated in the Egyptian vision of 2030. 
So by 2030, the, the country is now seeking for more empowerment for the women. And the empowerment is taking like several forms, like for example, the political empowerment for women, so that more women would be involved in the political and would have political roles. There's also the so social empowerment for women by increasing the women's freedom of choice and to achieve gender equity in the working in the working environment. This is what I mentioned as a major challenge, and it's now being like mitigated in the current strategy. Also, there is legal empowerment for women now by putting like more protective laws for the women. And there's also economic empowerment by providing more funding initiatives for women. And we are also having this active National Women Council in Egypt who is supporting women to be at their best. So we do have a national initiative and we have the role of academies and the academies either like national academies uh, like the ASRT in Egypt and also the international academies. So, for example, let me give you a, a hint of an initiative which is funded by the Europe Aid, but then coordinated by the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology. And this initiative is called Women Up. So this Women Up initiative is fostering the women participation in the local development. So the women are now part of the society and they should participate in the local development. So they are trying to fund the female startups and micro businesses, and especially the women in the household. If she has like an idea for a micro business or a startup, then they are going to uh, uh, fund this initiative and support that. And in order to give you some concrete examples about this Women Up initiative, they have now funded like uh, projects which are um, um, uh, applied by women related to uh, founding online teaching platforms, medical counseling platforms, using recyclable materials for sustainable development, using like uh, waste of the fruits and vegetables to provide like fibers and artwork. So whatever idea which is applicable by the women, it's now being uh, incubated and taken by this initiative. And we are really proud of this initiative and many wonderful projects have came out of this initiative. We also have an initiative of the AGIA, the Arab German Young Academy for Women Empowerment precisely in agriculture. So after surveying that there are many challenges facing women in agriculture, the Arab German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, they just opened like the lines of exchange between the women in agriculture in the Arab world and in other region. So in this sense, the AGIA has organized an interdisciplinary conference on women empowerment in agriculture and this conference brought about women who are engaged in agriculture in the Arab world, either like farmers, research, researchers, engineers, entrepreneurs, and policymakers. And then they had this knowledge exchange and networking with people from Germany and other countries from the global south, like Benin, Kenya, Nepal, and Kazakhstan. And uh, I left the link here if you want to know more information and then more detailed uh, report on the success stories of these women are being to be published uh, soon. We are also proud of the GYA initiative, the Women in Science Group, which I'm in which I share um, um, my uh, which I do some tasks with the, with this group and also with the in, uh, in cooperation with uh, Shalini. This working group, it actually aims to have the voice of the women scientists heard so that they can reach policy makers and decision makers for a better future of the female scientists. And I really believe that this group is doing such a great work and it's like being followed by several people from several countries, several women, because they see the women of the GYA as role models and they seek our advice for, like for mentoring and they send us emails for uh, like to have professional advice. So I really believe that the Women in Science Group is really doing such great work and it believes actually in the global contribution of women so that we are creating a platform where the challenges and the possible solutions are tackled for the capacity building of the group members and also the uh, females who are not group members but also interested in this group. So we do have uh, like we are doing such wonderful job in this group and I'm really proud to be part of this group. And I left also the website link if you want to know more information about this group and its activities. 
uh, another initiative of another academy is the African Academy of Science, and they have launched a mentoring platform. This mentoring platform is not just for women, it's also for men. Uh, but this mentoring platform is really serving well the female scientists in their careers. And this mentorship scheme is connecting the African early career researchers with mentors. And these mentors are experienced professionals from the industry, from academia, they are policy makers as well, so that they are guiding the mentors throughout their career and they are allowed to create uh, this new generation of science leaders in Africa. So this is a wonderful platform which is leached, but which is um, uh, like uh, developed by the African Academy of Sciences. And I also left the website if you want to know more information about this mentoring pro program. So as we see, it's not just national initiatives of the country. We have national academies which are participating to women empowerment and we also have international academies like the gya the agia and the african academy of science as well but then how to attract more women in scientific scientific careers we have like personal initiatives and the most famous one that we do have is developed by the gya alumina professor dr amal amin from egypt who is the founder of the international women in science without borders she she thought of developing like a series of conferences we had this conference in brazil this year and it was preceded by two others in egypt and one in south africa which is an initiative to increase the cooperation between female and male scientists on the basis of scientific excellence and also the participants they are not just uh, science uh, women scientists they are also uh, like undergraduate students who are participating and this really positively influences the women in science more women to to pursue careers in STEM. And this is a wonderful initiative that we are proud of. And I also left the Facebook group because it's very dynamic and send, sends posts like uh, on a daily basis or, or frequent basis. So if you want to know more information about the movement, you can visit the Facebook uh, page. Okay, then I have an advice for every woman who wants to be a leader. You should have like 10 important traits. The first one, you should have a vision. You should have a vision of what you are uh, now and what you want to be in the future. You know, like when the HR uh, asks you, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? This is a really important question that we should be asking ourselves. What, where are we seeing ourselves in like after a year, after five years, after 10 years, what do I envision myself to be doing in the future? And what do I want my future to look like? And what do I want, how do I want to influence people around me? So having a vision is very important. Also having a decision-making ability, because if someone is taking the decisions for you, then you are not going to have control of your life. So you should have a decision-making ability to, to have decisions quickly and to be responsible for these decisions. And trust me, even if you, if you take like a wrong decision now, you are going to learn from it and it's going to add to your personality and your experiences. So never be afraid to take decisions. Also, the ambition is very important. You should see yourself like it's the sky is your limit. You should have ambition and you you have um, like a vision of what you want to achieve and you should strive to add, to achieve what you want so ambition is very important also positivity and the positive vibes is very important because all of us we have problems and we have many challenges that we face but if you face that with, with positive vibes and positivity then you are going to conquer all the problems that you are facing also, self-confidence is very important. And uh, let me here give you like this personal example. Um, in 2010, uh, it was my first time to travel alone and it was to conduct research for six months in the UK. I have never traveled alone before and it was such um, like before I travel, I was afraid of traveling what uh, I'm going to encounter. I didn't have confidence in myself that I'm going to make it. But then after the plane landed uh, in UK and I found myself able to uh, to like um, um, 
face every situation that uh, I have seen and um, deal with the people and be independent, it really fostered my self-confidence and it's really important. So please don't be afraid and take steps and challenge yourself and uh, please get out of your comfort zone and have confidence in yourself that you are going to do it, then you are going to do it, literally. Hard work is also important because if you really have a dream that you want to achieve, then hard work is really important to be able to realize this dream. And then constant self-development. I, For example, I can claim that uh, my personality has changed than last year and that than the year before that. So I'm constantly doing like self-development. I'm fostering certain skills and I'm um, knowing what are the defects that I have and I'm working on them and I'm challenging myself and I'm focusing on my strengths. So the constant self-development is very important. Also another important advice and another important trait is that you should support yourself, you should surround yourself with a supportive environment because we are all surrounded by those like toxic people and unsupportive people, even in the, like in your circle or within your work and if you do not surround yourself with supportive people, then you are going to lose a lot. So supportive environment is very important for a woman to strive and to be a leader and to be empowered. Also the persistence and never giving up because we are always faced with problems, always faced, faced with challenges. So if you are persistent enough and never giving up, then you are going to overcome everything. And then I would have to say time management, like um, I have, I, I'm, I'm actually a time management freak. So if, for example, I have here this note in which I have like, let me open the page, for example, I have this daily to-do list that I have to fulfill every day. And I have this monthly to-do list and then to-do list for a year. So by having this time management uh, skill, I explore all the possibilities and I uh, have time to do everything. I have time for work. I have time for myself. I have time for my friends. I have time for uh, my family. So time management is very important because it can help you take advantage of every opportunity that you have and it can help to um, like um, um, uh, foster uh, the time management skill in you and it really positively affects uh, everything that you do either in your work either in your life so this is really very important okay so personally how do i empower women in my organization as i told you that i'm uh, an academic who is doing teaching and doing research so what are my strategies to empower the women in my organization, in, um, in my working environment, and even the organizations that I'm a member of? First thing is mentoring, mentoring and more mentoring. Uh, mentoring is very important because uh, from my experience and from what I realized is that very um, a large number of women, they want to do like very important things, but they don't know where to start. So. I like give them professional advice in their career. I let them be aware of the opportunities, several opportunities that they can have. And um, sometimes they are really lost. They don't know from where they can start. So I help to guide them in this regard. And we have like many successful stories of women who have pursued this career in STEM and they are very successful now. And I am really happy to, to be one of their mentors. Another important thing that I do in my organization is the support and encouragement, because um, as I always say, life is really hard enough. So if we can take like positive parts in each other's lives, if you can support someone and if you can encourage someone, this can really have a tremendous effect on his productivity and um, um, it really positively affects um, his or her career at certain stage. So the support is very important. Try to be uh, supportive for everyone around you and to encourage everyone around you so that they can achieve the best uh, of themselves. 
also more, more awareness on opportunities. I realized that uh, many of the um, people in my organization, they are not aware of the opportunities like funding opportunities, travel opportunities. So I always try to disseminate whatever I, ha I uh, encounter from opportunities of funding, of travel, of exchanges in my social network via emails on uh, the faculty website so that they can um, have more visibility and more people are encouraged to do uh, to 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 take on these opportunities also i'm trying to involve the students as early as possible now it, during my undergraduate lectures when i enter uh, a lecture uh, um, for my undergraduate students i always keep a part of the lecture for uh, the non-scientific content or the uh, the non um, educational content it's just for capacity building. I, I tell them, okay, so you are pharmacists and I don't want you to limit yourself to the educational material that I'm giving you. You should explore further possibilities, trainings, internships, either national or international. You should really build your uh, personality. And I try to give them some advice or skills and you really don't realize how impactful it was because um, you open, you, 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 it's like um, you open their minds to certain things that they haven't thought of before. They are always thinking of having the exams and uh, taking, having good grades, but then they are not thinking of the next step. So you, when you try to involve them as early as possible, this is really impactful and you can really direct someone to, to, to have this like, um, uh, to, ha to, to achieve the best of himself or herself and to uh, embark on opportunities and to uh, add to his or her personality. So please involve them as early as possible because this is very impactful. And then my last advice for every woman, you should first know yourself, know your strengths, know your defects, and then believe you in yourself that you can do it and try always to develop yourself and to be the best version of your personality and of yourself and never limit your challenges. You just challenge your limits and strive for never ending improvement. This is really very important. And I will end my presentation with a quote that I have mentioned in the next Einstein Forum. I was a panelist and then they asked me during the panel, so what would be your message for the female scientists? So I said that even if there are challenges, women just be patient, we are going to rule the world. So I hope that this can be achieved and I really have this big faith and great faith in women and female scientists and I know we can continue to empower each other and then we and that we can really achieve something and someday we are really going to rule the world. Uh, thank you so much and if you want to uh, further contact me I would be happy to uh, share more information and I would be happy to uh, be in contact with you after this presentation. This is my email and this is my Twitter account and I really like to, uh, to be in contact with you after this uh, seminar, after this presentation. And also thank you Shalini for the wonderful opportunity. It has been like very great and thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Maha. What a wonderful presentation and I really enjoyed and our uh, audiences from different continents have also enjoyed your presentation very much. You have very nicely presented and uh, you have built the confidence further uh, through your presentation and sharing your own experiences and um, tips that are coming out of your own experiences so thank you so much and uh, we have a few questions from our audiences one of the audiences her name is Poonam and she's asking that um, I'm facing a lot of challenges like work home etc and trying to overcome them can you share some mantras or advice to follow to overcome all these challenges this is a very very common question and uh, we have been listening for past two days that you know women face this often and they want to know how to manage both because they have to manage home as well as you know uh, outside world and at the same time they are very ambitious so please maha guide us 
Okay, so um, my advice in this case is time management, time management, time management. So please just write everything that you have. You know, sometimes I write even the um, small, even the small task that I have to do, I write it in my notebook. And then I really believe that women are capable of multitasking. You always see women, she is holding her baby and then she is doing like cooking and she is watching television and she's reading something. So just believe in yourself that you can multitask and do several things at a time and you will do it. At first, it's going to be hard, but then if you write everything and try to manage your time, it's everything is going to be possible. Oh, what a wonderful advice. And I just would like to quote you here and support what you are saying. Uh, recently, during the lockdown, the Women in Science Working Group uh, where me and uh, Rola Inglesi, who was also one of the party, uh, one of the speaker in this international series, we, we wrote a um, statement, and the statement was nothing but what actually the women are facing during this lockdown, and that got published, and then we got recognition from you know various international organizations, including International Science Council. They put it on, put their it on their website, and it was just you know whatever experiences we were facing uh, in our day-to-day -day life due to lockdown. We just you know all the women in science working group member wrote down. So sometimes you know we think that this is very simple or may not be you know acceptable, but. Uh, you know that that makes a very big difference so so go for it and uh, that's all so let me see what is other question uh, dr maha people across uh, the different places are from, uh, are listening here they are the audiences and uh, they are really appreciating your presentation um, saying that your session is very good you have motivated us encouraged us really really positive and thank you so much there is one more question from our audiences and uh, the audience is asking that uh, to achieve on international platform some of the fellowships international fellowships how do you uh, what is your advice to grab some of the biggest international uh, uh, opportunities uh, yeah, I can share now in the chat link some of the very active groups for sharing scholarships, trainings, and it's open for international students, and they really have large number of followers. I'd be happy to share some of these uh, uh, websites and some of the Facebook pages, and they are really beneficial, so I would oh. share them now in the chat box. Yes, please share. It will be definitely uh, helpful because sometimes, you know, lack of knowledge. We there, and I, I believe that women has uh, a lot of capacity, capability, ability. They are multitasking, as you said, and already women have been proving that. So only it's the matter of support, uh, supporting each other. Please do share um, that uh, links, and uh, I'm sure all the audiences will stay in touch. Uh, for both technical collaboration, for non-technical collaboration, for your support as a mentor, and many of you, many of would like to become your mentee. So, so I hope you will not mind and you will continue uh, addressing all of us. Thank you so much, Maha, once again for being here. Thank you so much Shalini, for the opportunity and thank you every one of the audience and the distinguished speakers that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maha. And uh, we go ahead with uh, our next uh, talk. Um, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, that is CSIR, is one of the largest publicly funded research and development organization and is known for its contributions in diverse areas of science. Uh, and CSIR has uh, various themes and opportunities and especially for women uh, in, in this country. So today we have with us Dr. Shekhar Mande, who is um, Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, and the Secretary of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, India, uh, is our speaker of the day. And I would like to share the screen. So, 
Yes, Professor Mande is structural and computational biologist, and he's an ex-director. Before this position, he was a director of National Center for Cell Science, that is NCCS Pune. He's a leading expert in DNA fingerprinting and diagnostic. He holds a doctor of philosophy in molecular biophysics from Indian Institute of Science. And uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at University of Groningen in the Netherlands. He also worked as a senior staff scientist at Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. Uh, he received Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, one of the very, very prestigious award for science and technology in 2005. Uh, he's a fellow of all the science academies in this country, and there are many, many more awards and achievements on his credit. And uh, I'm, I'm really thankful, uh, uh, Dr. Mande, for your uh, uh, acceptance to be here today uh, with us for sharing your experience-based uh, advice and you will be delivering a talk on empowering women in science. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Shalini, so very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be amongst all of you. Uh, I do see a number of familiar names as I read them. Uh, it would have been lovely to meet all of you a single platform, but uh, we live in times such as this that all of us uh, happen to meet on uh, the uh, uh, e-platform rather than anything else. Let me see if I can share my slides. And I do hope that you're able to see my slides. Yes, Shami? we are able to see clearly. Yes. Uh, there is a very inspiring talk, Dr. Maha, and I'm glad that you have set the stage of what I wanted to say. Uh, uh, I'm going to actually pick up on a couple of points that you said about role models and things like that. Uh, but what I would like to start uh, Shalini with, with is a few examples from our rich history and culture. And what I would like to highlight here is that uh, uh, our society has always considered women as an integral part of the mankind development. You know, I mean, that's how we have all grown up. Uh, we have always idealized our mothers. We have idealized, uh, idealized goddesses. We have idealized figures like uh, Zashi Kirani, Savitri Bai Phule, and so on and so forth. So it's in our culture uh, that we actually idealize both men and women equally. And therefore, there is no reason why we should feel uh, that we are not having sufficient contributions for women. Having said that, uh, if you look at, at all platforms, the representation of women, whether be it uh, at the teaching or businesses or in science and technology in particular, uh, the representation of women is pathetically low. And our challenge is actually how do we increase that particular representation and how do we actually make sure that everyone has equal opportunity in contribution to the development of mankind. Now, okay, having said that, let me give you a couple of examples from ancient India of how we have always considered uh, women to be a very integral part of our society. And first of my example is that of the very famous sage called Yagya Valkya. Uh, many of you would have heard of Yagya Valkya. Uh, he's a sage who lived in the uh, about the sixth to seventh century BC and has been credited for a lot of philosophical debates that happened then, and especially is credited for concepts like Advaita and things like that. And uh, Yagya Valkya, uh, uh, one of his wives was Maitreyi, and his conversations with Maitreyi are very famous in the Indian, uh, ancient Indian text. And they also find their uh, description in things like Upanishads and so on and so forth. And one of the conversations Maitreyi asks Yagya Valkya, that Lord, if my all my possessions were to fill the entire earth, would they bring me immortality? And uh, it's a very deep philosophical questions. And Yagya Velkya probably knew that he is going to live for the heavenly abode, and he is going to leave his wife behind. And it is at that time actually he describes to her the concept of atma and self and consciousness and so on and so forth. And that's actually a very profound debate that actually happened with the conversation that happened between Yagya Velkya and Maitreyi. But on the other hand, 
Gagia Velkia being a very well-known uh, person and very well-read and very well-respected uh, learned person, he also encountered several debates from uh, people who used to come and challenge him. And one of the persons who challenged him very successfully, and uh, once again, that is a part of our folklore, Indian folklore, is none other than Gargi. And Gargi used to go and ask very inquisitive questions to Yagya Velkia, right? And one of the very famous questions that Gargi asked, once again, very, very profound in Indian philosophy, is that which they say is above heaven and below the earth, which is between heaven and the earth as well, and which was, is, and shall be, tell me, what is it woven, war, and woe? Very, very profound question. Just to highlight the fact that both Gaidai, Gargi and Maitreyi challenged Yagya Velkya and just shows how important actually we, our women have been in Indian, uh, ancient Indian history and also development of our philosophy, sciences and all. And this is the question that eventually led to the concept of Akasha or nothingness. You know, Akasha was essentially nothingness. He said it is a vacuum uh, or ether uh, between earth uh, above the heaven and below the earth. And this actually is limitless. There is no limit to it. And we cannot go very far. However far we can go in Akasha, there is still more Akasha to be explored. And that actually is a very philosophical debate between Yagya Velke and Gargi. And see how profound questions were asked by these two very famous and very revered ladies in our ancient Indian history. Let me come closer to time and let me focus more on science and technology as we understand today. Well, in the Indian context, uh, the science and technology has always been connected with human mind. There's one of the profound things that uh, the way uh, science and technology developed in India till about 18th century was always very intricately connected with Indian mind, our mind, human mind. And uh, unfortunately so happened that with the rise of the colonial power here, uh, the mind and uh, SNT got disconnected. And therefore, what we understand modern today essentially concerns that what is related to the material world, while the mind and the consciousness and whatever think of other things actually are a realm of some other disciplines, which is unfortunate, but it's up to us to bring it back together and connect science and technology once again with the mind. But how did the modern science actually connect? And what were the other important contributions of many, many women who contributed to the development of Indian science and all? And what example better than that of Lilavati? Bhaskari Acharya was a very famous mathematician. He wrote a number of uh, treatises in the 12th century. He lived in a place called Patan Devi, very close to what is today's Jalgao or near close to Aurangabad. In Patan Devi, there is a temple and uh, Bhaskaracharya actually used to be there. And that's there, the texts such as Bijaganita were all written. The birth of modern algebra and some part of geometry can be traced to that of Bhaskaracharya. It predates the school of Madhava in Indian uh, sciences. Now, Bhaskaracharya uh, was also an astrologer. And he had predicted uh, that Lilavati would not be happy as a married person. But nonetheless, uh, what happened was she was married. And unfortunately, uh, she lost her husband within a few months of her marriage. And then she came back home. And then she was kind of depressed. And to get her out of depression, Bhaskaracharya started narrating stories to Lilavati. And all the stories were based on things like what we call today as number theory, algebra, and so on and so forth. And he would often pose problems to Lilavati. And there's a very famous text that he eventually wrote called Lilavati. You know? And the stories that actually, and the problems that he would pose were things like this. And here's a very important problem that all of us can actually put our heads on. He says, of a group of elephants, half and one third of the half went into a cave. One sixth and one seventh of one sixth was drinking water from a river. One eighth and one ninth of one eighth were sporting in a pond full of lotuses. The lover king of the elephants was leading three female elephants. 
how many elephants were there in the flock imagine this kind of questions which are based purely on algebra were posed to lilavati and she eventually became the source of inspiration of bhaskaracharya his daughter became a source of profound inspiration to bhaskaracharya and he actually wrote several treatises one of them is lilavati one of them is bijaganita and so on and so forth and a few years ago the indian academy of sciences bangalore actually brought out a, a very nice volume on the leading indian women scientists uh, through the centuries and the title appropriately was of course lilavati so this is the example that i thought would take as what would be considered as part of our culture part of our folklore and part of what we think has always been there in our society a very respect and the involvement of women in every aspect that we do in day to day including science and technology unfortunately uh, this part was lost somehow and it's up to us to bring it back into our culture once again let us look at some of the role model women in the modern science and i talk of last about 100 years i'm going to give two examples one from the west one from india and the example from the west that i have chosen is that of dame kathleen lonsdale uh she was a very well known crystallographer she practiced x-ray crystallography as a profession which i also happen to do uh, part of my career and kathleen lonsdale was of course uh, famous for many different things she was the first woman to be elected as a fellow of the royal society in london so she became one of the two women uh, to be elected as a frs and she was among the first these two women who became frs in 1945 Now, as I said, Kathleen Lonsdale uh, is known for many of her different contributions that to the society, but very profound contributions to crystallography. In the 1920s, uh, just as the X-ray crystallography was developing as a field, and I thought in uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, this would be a very apt example to give because is the chemistry of the earliest time. All of you know that about 1911, 1912, 1913, 19, that was the period. when people discovered that uh, crystals act as a three dimensional grating to x rays and therefore if you put crystals in front of the x rays you get a diffraction pattern beautiful diffraction pattern and a diffraction pattern has all the information about the molecular structure of what is there in the crystals so precise atomic arrangement of molecules precise arrangement of atoms within the molecule exists in these crystals and the diffraction pattern that was a discovery that was made uh, by lowe and his colleagues and then the explanation was given by brack father and son and uh, there are many people who started practicing uh, crystallography very soon afterwards kathleen gonsdale was one of the first few of those people one of the first uh, problem that she was actually fascinated by is that of structures of aromatic compounds and kathleen gonsdale argued that although benzene cannot be crystallized now remember we are talking of 1920s uh, although benzene cannot be crystallized the alternate to uh, 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 closest to aromatic compounds would be hexa substituted benzene and she actually solved the structure uh, of uh, uh, hexa methyl benzene uh, 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 and she also uh, 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 propagated that we should solve the structure of anthracene and naphthalene and the structure of anthracene and naphthalene was proposed none other than someone called kedareshwar benerji in the indian association of cultivation of science in calcutta now that's another folklore another story a paper in nature in 1929 but it's for another day to talk about but kathleen thompson saw this structure she had already solved the structure of diamond and that of graphite along with the uh, brags and uh, she argued that the structure of uh, hexamethyl benzene would be like a diamond uh, or something like this where all the carbons would be in tetrahedral state or in graphite where the carbons would be in the same plane and then she went on to show that instead of the diameter of the di carbons being uh, 1.42 uh, actually it would have been much less and the angles the bond angles between the different bonds would be about 120 thereby suggesting that it would be a planar structure is one of the first evidences that aromatic compounds 
will have to be planar. It is much before Huckel's rules, much before the concept of pi orbitals was suggested. As I said, uh, it's also credited partly to Kedareshwar Banerjee, who did the structure of anthracene and naphthalene uh, immediately thereafter. And therefore, aromatic compounds came to be known as planar compounds since then. And she was one of them. But Kathleen Lonsdale also had very strong social views. And in fact, she landed up in jail of all the places. And why? Because she was drafted for the war duty during Second World War. And she refused. She said that wars are against humanity. And therefore, she has a right to refuse that. For which she was fined. And she refused to pay the fine, saying that I am philosophically opposed to the war. And therefore, I am neither going to be drafted myself for a war duty, nor am I going to pay a fine. And consequently, she was sent to a jail. And look at the bravery of the woman. Such a brave woman, all of us must appreciate her bravery. In the 1930s, 1940s, early 1940s, she actually went to the jail for opposing in the war. But yet, she continued her profound contributions to crystallography even then. Closer to our home, there are many, many examples that I can, we can talk about. Uh, there are many women who have made very good contributions to my own organization, CSIR. Uh, okay, there are many of them, uh, Ajiti Pant, for example, many of you would have heard of. Uh, some of you would have heard of Violet Bajaj. Uh, Violet Bajaj unfortunately passed away about a month ago. She passed away at the age of 103, but she was uh, the colleague or contemporary of Kamala Sohani in IISC, one of the first few in IISC to receive PhD in science from India. <coughs> Sorry. But the example that I've chosen is that of Janki Amal. Janki Amal also was associated with CSIR for a short while in our lab in Jammu. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Janki Amal was a very pioneer botanist of the country. She went overseas in the 1920s, 1930s to obtain PhD from University of Michigan. Then she was in London in John Innes Center. And then she was invited back by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru to contribute to a independent India. And then she went on to become Director General of the Botanical Survey of India. But then she was also officer on special duty at the Regional Research Laboratory in Jammu, a part of CSIR lab. And we have a herbarium named after her in Jammu today. The Institute has since been named as Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine. And once again, an extraordinary woman of steel, extraordinary woman who could serve as a role model for even modern day young women. What I would like to do is make certain general comments. Uh, I don't want to go too much uh, uh, into preaching. Uh, many of the comments that I'm going to make, uh, you probably would have heard from many different people. So I'm going to be very brief, but rather we would spend some time on questions and answers after my talk. The first of the comment that I would like to make is that by not involving women in our society equally, we are losing 50% of the productive workforce. Imagine, is a 50% of the productive workforce is what the society is losing. And it's a huge loss to the society. We could have been so much better had women equally contributed to the development of society from all angles. And that actually is a huge embarrassment for all of us. And we must make efforts from now to make sure that contribution of women in every endeavor is 50%. They represent 50% of our society and therefore women have every right to contribute 50% in the development of our society. In many management schools, there's an example that is given about how mothers in India uh, balance their jobs, especially working mothers. Uh, I don't know whether this is still true in the modern generation, but at least in my generations, uh, those of us who had working mothers, uh, there is a terrific example. And uh, working mothers, uh, imagine, would get up early in the morning, prepare tiffins for their children, prepare tiffins for their husband, make sure that the children got up in time, make sure that the children got up uh, to go to school in time, pack them up properly, see them off, see the husband off, themselves would go to work, the woman would go to work, come back, 
catch up with all the household chores, prepare dinner in the evening, and yet be smiling all the time. How could they do it? I'm just amazed that how could mothers do it? I couldn't imagine any of my male colleagues uh, or uh, the previous generation uh, who could have actually done with equal ease as what our mothers and my friends' mothers and all, they used to do it. It's simply amazing. And there's a great lesson in this for all of us that by smiling face, people actually can do all the jobs if it is taken upon them. And women especially have a terrific ability to do this to a great extent. This ability is actually is a God's gift to women to do all the jobs with a smiling face. And that's amazing. In terms of science and technology, there have been certain efforts taken by government, scientific departments, and so on and so forth. I would just like to advertise here my own scientific department. That is the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research has a program called Technology Development and Utilization Program for Women, TDUPW. And I would like to encourage uh, many of you who would like to uh, approach this particular program. Uh, the Sujada Chaklanovais, uh, she is now currently coordinating this program from DSIR uh, to do this. But coming back to the first uh, sentence, the loss of 50% of productive workforce is a great loss to the society. And for that, we must create innovative solutions. And I just have some uh, solutions which have been highlighted here. I received it from my colleague in Niri Nagpur. Uh, she is a part of one of your organizations, what you call as uh, OWSD, which I believe Shalini is also a part of that. Atiya is a, a vice president of OWSD. And uh, some of the possible interventions that we can do is we need policy changes which are required. We need some innovative, innovative policy changes. And I will come to what CSIR is doing in this respect in the next slide. Can we link gender balance to GDP? I think it's high time our economists start putting gender balance as an integral part of the way GDP is calculated. Unless we do that, I don't think the nations across the world will start putting serious efforts in the involvement of women uh, in workplaces. We must change the way we look at things. We must think beyond social and cultural problems. We must recognize that science and technology are the only key drivers of economic growth in the country. And therefore, we must link women in the workforce to SNT development. I made this point already earlier, so I don't want to go then uh, get too much into it. How do we catch them young? How do we develop leadership qualities early on? How do we actually give them power to make decisions? And once again, I would like to advertise a program of my own organization, CSIR. We have HRDC, the Human Resource Development uh, Center in Ghaziabad, and it keeps uh, conducting programs uh, every now and then. And one of the programs that it conducts is that to train mid-career women for leadership positions in future. And I personally take interest in this particular program, and I also go and give lectures on leadership development uh, capabilities and how do you develop leadership to this particular group as well. So all of you are welcome to contact RK Sina, who is the head of HRDC in Ghaziabad and would like to enroll for this program. Your uh, enrollment would be more than uh, welcome. We need networking support. It's just not the Facebooks or Twitters, but just like imagine the boys clubs where men make all the major decisions over a glass of beer. Those of you who have gone to things like Gordon conferences might recall that in Gordon conferences, many of the funding decisions, many of the papers are written, many of the papers are accepted or rejected over a glass of beer in the evenings, in the bar. After the academic sessions are over, most people head to the bars. Unfortunately, in day-to-day -day life, women don't have the luxury of this particular aspect. They don't have the time because they would like to spend quality time with their family after work. And therefore, we must find support for women to network in a very productive way, uh, but not in a bar or something like this. And Shalini, I would like to urge that we must undertake a survey on what are the stumbling blocks for women coming into leadership roles. The 50% sample must be males. We can't take women's views alone. We must take views from our male colleagues as well. 
on today's date in india the representation of women is about 15% which is a huge embarrassment embarrassment why can't we make it 50% and our leading organizations i don't think we are putting enough pressure on leading organizations such as indian institute of science bangalore or any of the iits i happen to be part of the indian institute of science council and i have raised this issue formally it is minuted in indian institute of science council is that indian institute of science bangalore must make a very conscious effort in increasing the percentage of women faculty which it has not happened and unless we all keep talking about it unless we bring embarrassment to our some of the best organizations because they have not paid attention to this very critical factor i don't think our organizations would be proactive uh, into uh, uh, hiring women into their faculty also we would like to see more and more women into leadership positions for all this what i would like to do uh, before i end is uh, just a highlight a fact uh, that we discussed in the society meeting of csir recently as all of you know uh, csir is an autonomous body uh, is a society of which the chairman is the honorable prime minister of india uh, and the society meeting actually takes a lot of uh, uh, important decisions for us and the last time the society met in february where the honorable prime minister chaired and there are a lot of people uh, you know society and we are very proud that we have a very healthy representation of women in our society so the academic representation uh, is given by mid career women who come from university or uh, national labs and similarly industry representation also there are couple of women from that side so i'm very proud that at least in csi society we have tried to maintain a balance uh, to have equal representation but the problem that we discussed in our society formally and it was minuted was for women empowerment in science we must have innovative solutions for example age relaxation for recruitment of women scientists must be considered and by age relaxation i mean to say it should not be 3 years or 5 years i mean to say that in all our recruitments women should not have any age consideration we should not say that the candidate must be below the age of 35 we should not say that candidate must be below the age of 40 if it's a female candidate we should say that there is no bar on the age it is only then that we will be able to recruit more women into our organizations we must encourage women leadership in science as i said csir through hrdc has been organizing leadership development programs for senior officers from csir and we would also like to welcome participation from organizations outside csir of women scientists to develop leadership skills you are most welcome to join this now uh, i have also taken an action on the point that we discussed in our society that the topic of age relaxation for recruitment of women is being referred to a committee set up and we are looking at various recruitment issues at csir and i do hope that in the coming years we will have equal participation of women at all levels in csir but not only in csir collectively we can make sure that we have equal participation of women in all endeavors of human development i would like to highlight in the last before i part there is a paper that appeared in nature on 8th july that is 3 days ago and it says that we are passing through a very difficult time an unprecedented time you would have heard it number of times but the people who are affected most in this unprecedented time are women and the title of the paper itself in nature is women are most affected by pandemics lessons from past outbreaks and can we not address this immediately is it not possible for us to address this issue immediately can we not actually generate a base paper very quickly in next 10 days shalini if we can actually generate a base paper on this and say that the negative way it has affected women it is our duty to make sure that is addressed on emergency basis let us all get together and let us make sure in next 10 or 15 days we come up with a base paper and submit that to the government saying that these 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 steps must be taken so that the negative way in which women are affected by the pandemic must be corrected only then we would have fulfilled our duty to the society as i said we are living in the extraordinary time uh, one of the unfortunate fallouts is that we are not able to meet in person all of us but i do play hope uh, that uh, by talking in the cyberspace i have been able to make my points and would like to meet all of you 
so sometime or the other in person very soon thank you all very much wow thank you professor uh, dr mande it was so fantastic to listen to your talk starting from the vedic uh, ancient times giving an example of bhaskaracharya and the leelavati's uh, book i had an opportunity to go through that uh, book and uh, it's it's really really inspiring and 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 I, as you say that you know women um, due to gender stereotype they say that women or girls do not have ability to learn um mathematics and that is uh, that is not at all true and uh, that has been proven you know during the ancient time also and the examples uh, of the scientists that you uh, gave and now also e e current uh, situation also uh, some of the women are uh, proving that so our audiences have appreciated this talk a lot and uh, there are there are many questions they would like to ask and uh, i pose here the first question we say women are revered in india but do you believe that even today gender equity or equality is still not at the level it should be absolutely uh, look around us uh, there lot to be done to uh, achieve gender equality in our society is very embarrassing that we don't have it and collectively all of us must address it is not only women who should be talking about it it's also men who should be talking about gender equality and we must uh, strive hard to get uh, a gender equality in all fields uh, of human endeavor yeah that that's really really true that you know it's a big challenge in front of all the organization not only in india but at international level but uh, i i think it is possible uh, so i pose here the next question how to work in a team dominated by men and they make a lone women very useless see i think the only way and is not true for gender alone is also true this question for race is true for many other aspects where you actually find yourself in a minority in a group if once you find yourself in some sort of a minority either based on race or language or the geographical region that you come from or gender one has to believe in oneself right the belief in oneself is what will carry you very far all right and you have to be very emphatic about your views you should not feel ashamed to express your views if you believe in yourself and what you believe is your right all of us have faced this at some point of the other some sort of discrimination uh, when i was in the west we have faced discrimination at so many times okay uh, when we submit our papers to some of the leading journals don't we face discrimination we do because uh, we come from organizations which probably are not very well known as some of the better organizations organizations but we have to stand up on our feet and face the world with the conviction that we are as good as anyone else and if you have that conviction in yourself even if you have place in a committee which is gender imbalanced and even if there are other dominate the dominating male colleagues i'm pretty sure you will do well on this aspect Wow! Thank you, uh, Dr. Mande. What a what a great uh, words of motivation and inspiration. And uh, I, I think uh, for the past three days, almost you know, we have been listening for these encouraging and inspiring uh, words again and again. And uh, I think uh, because we face a lot of challenges, hurdles, and listening to such inspiring words uh, really helps. So I take ahead uh, another question. Uh, what according to you could be the reason for only 15% women leaders in scientific institutions what is the reason for uh, having a very less percentage that is 15% uh, women leaders in scientific institutions i think we have not been sensitive uh, in the recruitment processes uh, to give an example uh, many of our scientific institutions have age bars at every level many scientific institutions would say that if a person is more than say age of 35 okay i don't have to name the institutions here but uh, all of you know different institutions would know this is true that at age of 35 is a age bar now for whatever reason uh, many times uh, the situation is such that uh, a woman actually cross that particular age you know i don't we don't have to go into the reasons but uh, there are situations in which that age is crossed and automatically they became become invalid to apply for jobs because simply the age has gone up 
now this actually is a very very unfortunate situation and we must correct it and a solution that i have proposed is that there should be no age bar for women at any level of recruitment not only giving relaxation of 5 years there should be no age bar whatsoever for recruitment of women at any level and i do hope that i will be able to post my view in csi society and i do hope that during my tenure we'll be able to bring it in csi this particular amendment wow that's a very very nice and uh, having a no age bar is is really really very good initiative and i'm sure it will benefit women especially immensely uh, there is another question from farha uh, and uh, she's asking what are the options in csir who is having break due to marriage childbirth for women who having break due to marriage so uh, in a sense uh, actually what uh, the government does Uh, for women in service the uh, government actually does uh, look at it very sympathetically and therefore government has a pro provision to give what is called as a child care leave uh, which is being availed by many of my uh, colleagues uh, across csir and till the child becomes uh, at the age of 18 uh, the child care leave can be availed uh, you also get a maternity leave uh, for a particular period of time immediately after child birth and therefore there are these are some of the enabling mechanisms that have been given uh, to uh, to promote women uh, at least in the uh, government organizations and i do hope they are actually followed in letter and spirit across uh, the organizations yeah well, uh, we have a comment from dr andrea she says that normally young in sciences means up to 40 years old but for many women after having children this is the time when they start picking up and blooming in their career and then they are out of competition because they are not young <laughs> anymore and that's that's really uh, true uh, i have another question to pose and it is uh, from a student and uh she saying that generally uh, in the institutions research institutions there are supervisors who, who will not prefer uh, the women and in that also if the women is married uh, then you know unmarried girls are preferred over the married so i think i think it's a shame on those people who refuse to take girl students because they are married absolute shame uh if somebody says that please bring it to my attention if somebody in csr has done that i will take that person to a task but uh, what personally what i have done uh, i have had a fortune of having large number of girl students some of whom also married uh, were married some of whom were married during the phd time and because i do work on computational biology my field is slightly more easier to handle uh, such situations so uh, at least one example that i can quote that uh, one of my uh, girl students she married in the first year of her phd which all of us were very very happy for her because she was getting married and she is starting a family and but then her husband lived somewhere else her husband lived in delhi and my lab then was in hyderabad and then of course it became very difficult for her and actually became difficult for me to see that she would work in my lab for next uh, few years staying away from her husband <clears throat> so we tried actively to get her husband to hyderabad somehow that was not happening so then i contacted uh, a friend of mine a colleague of mine in delhi and uh, i contacted the director of his lab to see whether she can work in his lab and i can be a proxy guide to her so she can continue to work in my lab but she would actually work in my friend's lab and this actually happened for the following 2 years or 3 years she actually worked in my friend's lab in delhi thankfully the director of the institute was uh, very cooperative thankfully my friend was very cooperative and eventually she was able to publish she was able to finish her thesis she got a phd and she is doing pretty well now so i am very proud of uh, this kind of things that actually can happen and partly the same thing probably that cannot happen in experimental sciences but there are solutions to those problems as well and we must actually think of what kind of enabling solutions we can do yeah very true we have audiences from different continents we have with us bertha garcia who is a vice president of owsd and she's she liked your presentation a lot and she's thanking uh, you a lot for taking a lot of initiative in in favor of women uh, scientists in india 
uh, another audience sonali sen gupta is asking do you think that women think differently from men and can contribute to diversity in scientific thinking because of different genetic makeup and socialization absolutely not if anyone has ever said that i would call it utter nonsense both men and women are absolutely equal there is no difference in the ability of thinking of whichever kind that you may think of in all respects uh, uh, both men and women are absolutely equal i don't think if anyone ever tries to argue that either woman or a race or a language or a socio economic background of a person people are different i would not uh, agree to that particular view at all all of us are equally capable of all our ability yes thank you so much sir there is one more question from the audience and uh, generally we see that men when they get uh, higher opportunities higher position opportunities they are ready to shift to the different place but uh, if you look at the women uh, they are not re uh, ready to change their jobs or positions because of the family and uh, for that matter do you do you have any comment or advice what a woman should do when she has a higher opportunities Uh, than her present work. Please. Well, I think uh, men have to learn from women this particular aspect. I'm very sad that uh, my main colleagues don't learn this from uh, other women who have sacrificed this. I'll give you my own example, right? I mean, my own personal example. Uh, I was in Chandigarh. Uh, my first job was in Chandigarh Institute of Microbial Technology, and uh, despite our best efforts, uh, my wife was very keen on working. and she is as capable as i am in uh, science and uh, for some reason she was not able to find a job there at some point of time she found a job in hyderabad now our family would be divided between chandigarh and hyderabad and she decided to move to hyderabad it is at that time i decided that i was going to resign from institute of microbial technology in chandigarh which i actually did i resigned from there i moved to hyderabad thankfully there was another institute who gave me a job otherwise i would have been a jobless person by then So I did wow. job in Center for DNA Fingerprint and Diagnostics, and I did my make to make my career there. But uh, there was a conscious decision that if she found a job, I would move with her on that particular place. And I would like to tell my male colleagues that please do learn from women who sacrifice for their husbands. Male have men have equal responsibility to sacrifice for their wives, and they must make conscious efforts in doing that. but that's a very sad uh, truth that you know there are very few men uh, like you who are ready to sacrifice but as always women have to sacrifice they leave their jobs and they go along with their husbands so uh, there is uh, one more audience professor padma devrajan would like to pose a direct question to you uh, yes uh, good evening uh, professor mande uh, after hearing you and seeing how gender sensitized you are and particularly your last example about leaving your job and going with your wife what i was wondering is now you are saying this in a forum where i think 90% are ladies but this what you are presenting is ideally presented where there are more men so particularly with your position as dg csir i was wondering whether it's possible to hold a seminar or a webinar on gender sensitization what how men should contribute and have that kind of a seminar which you could lead and get men to participate that is very important because all these gender equality gender sensitization i am seeing women empowerment everything is a women centric women centered with a 5% 10% male uh, you know presence even here today i think on this there are only three men the rest are all <laughs> ladies so what i would like is really ask you whether you could take this forward you know because this is a very burning issue and people at your level particularly after hearing you i thought i should pose it directly and not just send it through the chat you know because ict to be frank does not have this kind of parity we have no differentiation between ladies and men it is your capability that decides where you are where you go and other things at least i am with ict for the past 30 plus years and i have never seen this gender bias you do see bias but not gender bias and bias is part of uh, human nature so we cannot avoid that but gender bias no 
fortunately my family even during the covid period i think i am getting so much support so i don't come in that nature you know where women have suffered more than men i am lucky but few of us are lucky like that so maybe Absolutely. your wife is lucky <laughs> i'm so glad that you raised this point yeah and uh, i'm so happy to hear about ict i think it's a great tribute uh, to the leadership of ict starting from professor mm sharma professor jb doshi uh, professor pandit all of them have been actually great human beings and uh, it's a tribute to all of them and all of you that uh, there is no gender uh, imbalance in ict uh, your uh, uh, suggestion i'm professor is, padma devrajan from pharma yeah yeah oh. it's a tribute Former to all head of pharma oh. your tribute to all of you uh, uh, your suggestion on csr holding the seminar is well taken it will be done uh, shalini i don't know whether you know atya kaple Yes, uh, I know her very well. Uh, so I am tagging Atya right now that she should get in touch with you, and in next ten uh, days we will hold a uh, meeting like this. I would like to see that the participation in such a seminar is fifty-fifty. I would be wow. very, yes, yes, fifty-fifty. Very unhappy if wow. the participation is uh, balanced in terms of uh, only women. I would like to see fifty-fifty participation in that, and then only we can actually have some kind of a meaningful dialogue amongst all of us. so uh, shalini you can expect a call from atya very soon yes. and you talk to her or otherwise you call her i'm going mm-hmm. to tag her in next about half an hour so you talk to her and then figure out when we can actually hold uh, this kind of a conference and wow. if i may suggest one more thing in this we should have invitees who are decision makers at the top level both women and men yeah also you know as invitees so that we are sure of their presence yes because otherwise the whole thing just gets diluted yeah so both of you work with atya and come up with a draft program and we'll organize a, a webinar on this together all of us yeah so uh, i think you have to leave now it's already 6 o'clock i have over shot okay thank, so thank, you, thank you so much thank you so much yes, thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much it was very very wonderful talk really really we all benefited immensely thank you dr mande for accepting uh, our invitation thank you so much thank you thank you audiences it was really interesting to know that csir under the leadership of dr mande uh, is going to take a lot of initiative in favor of women uh, to encourage them in science and uh, really really i feel so proud that you know today uh, we had dr mande with us and uh, going ahead Uh, with this program we have our next speaker of the day professor dr andrea camargo from brazil and uh, i met dr andrea just before this uh, lockdown uh, during um, uh, one of the world uh, forum for women in science and there i heard she talking on a very very prestigious fellowship that is alexander von humboldt and then i felt that uh, you know it's really of course she presented it so well and uh, dr andrea de camargo i'm really really thankful for accepting our invitation and uh, being here today and sharing your own experiences and uh, uh, the opportunities that you are experiencing with all of us so andrea is associate professor at sao carlos physics Institute of the University of São Paulo, Brazil. She is a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, one of the very, very prestigious foundation in the world uh, at uh, Münster, Germany. Uh, she is also the winner of Laurel Unesco Award for Women in Science in the year 2008. she's a affiliate member of brazilian academy of sciences we had yesterday director of brazilian academy of sciences she's a scientific director of brazilian materials research society and she's also a scientific ambassador of alexander von humboldt foundation so and in addition to that she is doing excellently excellent in her own area of research and she has multiple uh, number of research publication in uh, journals of high repute and standards and additionally she is actively involved in social aspects encouraging women uh, scientists in stem so with this i once again thank you dr andrea for accepting our invitation and over to you dear
Thank you very much, Aline. It's really a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to contribute a little bit to this forum. Uh, I have to say I was very much inspired by the last two talks. So I hope my talk is going to be uh, motivating for you guys too. The content is a little bit different than what has been said so far. So let me share my screen with you here. Just make it F5 in the presentation. Yes, perfect. Is it okay? Everybody yes. sees it? Yes. Very good. So um, as it was mentioned, I am currently an associate professor of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. But um, recently I have been appointed ambassador scientist for the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. So my job is to divulge the programs. And although I am mostly working in Brazil as an ambassador scientist, I think I have some things to say that might interest you with regards to valuable opportunities to pursue truly international top quality scientific careers. Uh, through the opportunities that the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation uh, can give you. So for those of you who are not so familiar, Alexander von Humboldt was a discoverer, a universal scholar, a cosmopolitan, and above all, a patron of excellent scientific talent. And the foundation that takes his name uh, was founded in 1953 by the Federal Republic of Germany and of course, in the spirit of its patron, it fosters an international network of scientific co uh, cooperation and trust. So the foundation promotes sponsorship for outstanding researchers from Germany and from abroad. Sponsorship decisions are based on the sole criteria of applicants' achievements and qualifications, and there are no quotas, neither for countries nor for disciplines. The foundation believes that even in times of increasing teamwork, the ability of the individual is the crucial factor for the academic success. And therefore, the foundation is proud to emphasize that it sponsors people, not projects. So they are really looking into the quality and potential of people. Of course, the projects are important. They have to be interesting. They have to be relevant. But the main focus is really the person the scientist. So researchers are given in that sense as much freedoms as possible to carry out their research projects in whatever host institution where they can find a suitable host. It's very important for Humboldt Foundation to foster equal opportunities for female academics. So I would like to call special attention of everyone to this slide here. Uh, because the foundation really seeks to make programs that are equally attractive and available for both male and females. But unfortunately, it is evident that the proportion of female academics is sponsored is significantly lower by comparison with the male colleagues. And as it's very often in our female scientific universe, this number drops with a higher career stage and also with increasing age. So part of my job here as an ambassador scientist is to help to change the scenery by motivating more female scientists in Brazil and around the world to apply for these opportunities. And AVH Foundation does its part by supplementing its sponsorship options with the following equal opportunity measures. So you can have, for example, extension of sponsorship period by up to three months if you have, uh, if you give birth during the approved sponsorship period. It's also possible to interrupt the fellowship period for up to 18 months if the birth of a child occurs within the sponsorship uh, program. Uh, or if you're taking care of children smaller than 12 years old also. There's also the possibility of payment of additional marital allowance for accompanying spouses that do not have any income and payment for child support, child allowance for families that are accompanied by children younger than 12 uh, years old. And here I always like to tell my story because I think it's quite representative and a good example of that because I myself found out that I had won the fellowship uh, in 2007 
in the same month that I found myself pregnant with my first child. So as a young scientist in the beginning of my career, you know, I was so inexperienced and I was a little afraid of communicating this to the foundation. So when they called me up to manifest my interest or not in the fellowship, I wrote to them and I said, you know, yes, I am very much interested in the fellowship, but there is a little problem. And then I revealed that I was pregnant and I was really surprised to receive an email about 10 minutes later saying, well, congratulations on the new member of the family. Uh, we would like to inform you that beside your regular fellowship, you're also going to have an extension of three months and an additional 300 euros to your uh, monthly uh, payment. So to me, that was very surprising at an early stage because I thought I would be punished for being pregnant and not being so welcome like this. So basically they wrote me that and then they said, uh, congratulations again, we're looking forward to welcoming you and the baby in Germany. So I think that's a nice story that I like to share with people because uh, I really believe that this fellowship was really a, a hallmark in my scientific career. So the foundation's planned budget for 2020 is approximately 145.5 million euros, of which approximately 96% are financed by the federal funds and the European Union. So of this amount, 47.6% is financed by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, 38.7% by the Federal Foreign Office, 8.2% by the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, 1.5% by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety, and 0.2% by the European Union. So the remaining 4% are provided by third parties and income from the foundation's assets, just to give you an idea. So let's take a look at the sponsorship uh, programs here. As you can see, there are opportunities for academics in different stages of career. Let's see if I can make my pointer here. So we have the sponsorship programs for different stages of careers, like for younger postdoctoral researchers and more experienced researchers, and then internationally renowned academics. And the programs are targeted at academics from abroad and also from Germany. So for each of these categories here, you have several options of fellowships and also awards that are granted by uh, the Humboldt Foundation. All of this information here can be found in detail in the website of the foundation, which I'm gonna present to you at the end of my talk. We're gonna take a look at some uh, details of them here. So. First thing is, the question I mostly get is, how do I find an appropriate host in Germany if I want to go for a postdoc or for a visiting research stay, you know, if I am already an experienced researcher? So, of course, my uh, obvious tip is keep eyes and ears open to German scientists that you meet at conferences or any other scientific event, and then approach them, talk to them, and explore the possibilities. But you can also access network online lists of the more than 30,000 individuals throughout the world who have been sponsored by the foundation and who can offer an overview of possible hosts to you. The network online can be searched by name, host, institute, subject area, location, or keyword. All you have to do is type in Humboldt Network uh, in Google and you're going to have easy access to a list of more than 30,000 individuals throughout the world. So then just choose your country and get in touch with our Humboldt fellows. Uh, you can also use uh, the names of the Humboldtians that a, a search turns up, and then you will be able to determine what their hosts were. Another option is to visit the Euraxis website. Uh, here you can also find a list of websites that can help in finding a host institution. And finally, there is this Garrett German Research Institutions directory that can also uh, provide information on possible hosts, uh, and it's very useful. 
So just to uh, situate you, the origin of guest researchers is pretty much divided by uh, like this. It changes a lot from year to year, but this is an average over 2015 to 2019. Because there are no quotas, no specific uh, partition of uh, um, fellowships and awards to each country, it is expected that these numbers will change. But as I said, this is only an average here. So this is the distribution Europe takes a slice of about 34%, Asia 29%, North America 15%, and then the other places of the world uh, go lower on the numbers. Now, uh, the research fellowship fellowships granted to researchers from Central and South America, which is my region here, and this is just for your curiosity, because I think most of the, uh, uh, the audience in this forum here is not from Central and South America. This is how it's divided. Green stands for Humboldt Research Fellowships, and uh, red, orange, it stands for Georg Foster Research Fellowships. We're going to talk about these two here and see the differences of them. So these are just numbers. For uh, out of curiosity, research fellowships granted to researchers from Brazil. So these are the number of applications year by year, and these are the number of actually fellowships that were granted. So since 2013, uh, Humboldt has associated with CAPES, which is uh, an agency that funds um, research and education in Brazil. So all the applicants in Brazil have to submit their applications to CAPES. So this is a partnership. But in the other countries, as far as I know, like India, you have to apply directly with the foundation in Germany. So this is just a detail. As you can see here, the number of applications, the ratio of uh, approved fellowships to the number of applications is improving in the latest years here but we still lack uh, more applications with higher quality of uh, science and people and capacity uh, to improve these numbers. So this is what we call the CAPES Humboldt Research Fellowship Programs. And I'm gonna use it as an example to tell you about the benefits and the characteristics here. But the fellowships that are granted directly by the foundation, like in other countries, they have the same characteristics. So the ratio of sponsorship is six to 24 months for postdoctoral researchers. And if you are a more experienced researcher, then it's six to 18 months. And because at this stage here, you're often very busy with teaching, administration and other things, then you may divide up your stay into three periods, which is very nice. The application period, of course, uh, has to be um, found out in the website because this is a characteristic for Brazil here. Fellowship amount ranges from 2,650 to 3,150, depending on your stage of career. So this is the Humboldt Research Fellowship uh, benefits here. I wanna go through this with you. So first thing is that the host institute in Germany is granted an allowance for research costs of 800 euros for research in the natural sciences and engineering and 500 euros for humanities. And because the Humboldt Foundation is a very prestigious one, the hosts in Germany are usually very interested in hosting uh, uh, um, Humboldt Fellows. So besides getting the prestige of hosting a Humboldt Fellow, they will also get money to host you and to help with the expenses of the research. Fellows also receive a single lump sum to cover for the travel expenses to and from Germany, of course. And the foundation finances language courses for foreign academics coming to Germany or uh, also language courses for their marital partners. Fellows can also ask for an allowance for a research stay at a research institute in another European country for a designated period during the course of the fellowship in Germany. And as a rule, the total duration of the European research stay may not account for more than 25% of the estimated total time of sponsorship. 
Now, the alumni sponsorship uh, programs includes further research stays in Germany up to three months every three years. And the research group linkage program allows Humboldtians from developing countries like ours and from emerging economies to cooperate over a period of three years with a researcher working at a German institute and additional cooperation partners in other countries as well. So in this alumni program, joint research projects can be receiving up to 55,000 euros for joint cooperation. Now the Humboldt Foundation can also sponsor Humboldtians through materials resources such as book donations after they, their stay, equipment of a small size up to 20,000 euros, and also printing subsidies. The Alexander von Humboldt Foundation also provides financial support to Humboldtians who organize regional and specialist conferences. They are called the Humboldt Colleagues and are popular instruments for strengthening regional and specialist network. Any Humboldtian can apply for uh, funds to organize such conferences with different topics. So here are the applications requirements. Uh, normally, uh, one first requirement is that uh, uh, applicants be above average in uh, that they have an, a doctorate with above average success or comparable academic qualification, independent research experience documented by recognized academic publications, preferably in international journals, adequate language skills, a research outline that is agreed with the academic host, of course, and confirmation of the host institute that the research facilities will be available for the, for the, the scientist. As a rule, candidates' chances are increased, of course, if they belong to the top group amongst their international peers. And the number of publications considered, of course, will vary according to the area, the field of research of the applicant. Now, what determines what, whether an application is successful is academic quality, not German language skills. In science, in particular, working groups function and publish in English. So in this case, it is not necessary to have a proven knowledge of German. English will suffice. However, if you're working on the social sciences, then it might be required that German uh, knowledge is proven because this might interfere with the success of the research. Experienced researchers should have their own clearly defined academic profile. And this means that they should usually be working at least at the level of assistant professor or junior research group leader and be able to document independent research work over a number of years in a comprehensive list of academic publications with recognized uh, independent profile. Now, besides the fellowships, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation also offers a number of research awards. For these research awards, you cannot be self-nominated. A partner in Germany, a scientific partner in Germany has to nominate you, except for the Sofia Kowalewskaya Award, which is another possibility. Uh, this one is a, a different program where you can apply to establish your own research group in Germany for a period of five years. And uh, it's then you can self-nominate yourself, but for all the other awards, somebody else has to do so. <clears throat> so the research awards <clears throat> are granted in different stages and in different modalities. So uh, the foundation grants up to 100 Humboldt Research Awards annually to internationally eminent academics in recognition of their entire academic record to date. So the award winners are invited to undertake research projects of their own choice in Germany for approximately six to 12 months. And the award is valued at 60,000 euros. Now, another option is the Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Bessel Research Award. These are granted approximately 20 uh, per year to internationally renowned academics from abroad also who have completed their 
PhD within the last 18 years in recognition of the outstanding academic performance of these researchers. So the value for this award here is up to 45,000. It depends uh, what, uh, you know, how the, uh, the contribution is evaluated, but it's up to 45,000. And uh, once again, I would like to emphasize here that the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation particularly encourages the nomination of quali qualified female academics because the number of awards granted to female academics is very low at the moment. So please, ladies, you know, more experienced researchers, uh, this is a tremendous opportunity here. Uh, if you have a contact in Germany, you can talk to them and maybe they agree to nominate you for one of these awards based on your academic achievements. The Georg Foster Research Awards are granted to internationally established researchers from developing and transition countries. So this is also very interesting for our forum here. Uh, this is granted to all disciplines in recognition of their entire academic record to date. The award amounts to 60,000 euros again. And in addition, award winners are invited to conduct research projects of their own choice in Germany in close collaboration with a specialist. So the idea of this Georg Foster Award here is that you're going to be working on a project that will directly benefit the development of a certain area or a certain field in your own country. The aim here is to establish long-term partnership between the German institution and host uh, and partner and your institution so that this can bring substantial uh, contributions to the development of the country. So to support the collaboration, the Humboldt Foundation may grant additional funding of up to 25,000 euros, particularly for participating in scientific conferences, additional material resources like specialized literature, scientific equipment, and so on. Other sponsorship programs that I would like to mention here is for instance, for instance, the International Climate Protection Fellowships, which is granted for prospective leaders from transition in developing countries. They must be engaged in climate protection and be working in non-governmental organizations, public administration, politics, etc. And this is aimed at people who would like to conduct an independent project agreed with a host in Germany. So here are some more details on the application requirements. Uh, you have to have a completed first university degrees less than 12 years previously to the application, clearly visible leadership potential in the area, extensive theme-related work experience, and you have uh, similar benefits to the other fellowships, like a 12-month stay in Germany, extension of up to three months, this is possible, introductory seminar, training courses, and language courses that are optional, of course, travel, uh, uh, travel funds and family allowances. Another interesting possibility is the German Chancellor Fellowship aimed at outstanding prospective leaders from Brazil, China, India, and so on. From a broad range of areas such as politi politics and public policies, law, media, business, non-governmental sectors, and so on. So this fellowship here is aimed at uh, potential leaders that are still young and uh, seeking for opportunities. And finally, to end this talk, I would like to talk about the Humboldt Network alumni sponsorship and networking, which we are quite proud of. As I said, we have nowadays more than 30,000 Humboldtians worldwide. It's not so difficult to find this. As I said, you just type in Humboldt Network in Google and you're gonna get direct access to this. So this is the distribution all over the world, as you can see here. And uh, the motto of the foundation is once a Humboldtian, always a Humboldtian. So from the very beginning, this was the hallmark of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. 
And it means that you're going to have a lifetime relation to the foundation once you are a Humboldtian. So you have all these uh, connections and long-term basis supports through the alumni sponsorship programs that I mentioned. And as a result, an active knowledge network of more than uh, 30,000 Humboldtians has been laid across the world over 140 states. So alumni sponsorships and international network uh, happens through uh, through many ways, like further research stays in Germany, the, the research group linkage program that I had mentioned, the Humboldt Colloquia and colleagues, which are these events that we can organize with this extra funding from the foundation. And since 2002, Humboldt Foundation has also been investing and helping in the establishment of the Humboldt Alumni Associations in different countries. So I myself have been president of the Humboldt Club in Brazil for two years. And this is a very nice network, uh, uh, a local network in Brazil to connect the Brazilian Humboldtians. I am pretty sure that other countries like India also have uh, this, uh, these clubs, these associations of alumni. So it's nice getting in touch with them if you're interested. Well, uh, as I am not exactly a staff person of Humboldt Foundation, I'm just a, a sci an ambassador scientist, I might not be able to answer all your detailed questions. So here I'm leaving the contact information if you want to discuss very uh, uh, precise details that you cannot find in the website. But of course, I will be glad, uh, glad to answer any questions you might have and I can answer. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Wow, what a nice presentation on this prestigious international fellowship, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, Dr. Andrea, could you please uh, stop sharing this presentation? Uh huh. Yeah, so I take a few questions from the audiences. Uh, for this Alexander von Humboldt, which is a very prestigious and I'm sure it must be a competitive fellowship, is there a special provision for women scientists? No, there is, there is no quota, Shalin, for females, but there is a strong effort to increase the number of female participants. So that's why they have all these uh, extra benefits that will make life easier for female participants. There is another question from an uh, audience and the audience is asking that for making the Humboldt Fellowship application, what one important tip or advice you would like to give uh, if uh, somebody wants to apply for it? Right, I think uh, one important tip is that you should uh, as the, the previous professor said, you should believe in yourself and you should emphasize your qualities as a person. You know, of course, it's important to have a good project, a strong, relevant theme of research, but you should really work on promoting yourself and the kind of scientist you are or you can become because Humboldt Foundation is really looking into potential of people. That's what they're interested in. They are interested in helping you develop uh, your full potential to become a top international scientist. Uh, for Humboldt Foundation, is there any subject specific selection uh, that is being done? You, you mean subject? Well, sorry, I didn't yeah. get it. They, subject there, area, do they look for the subject area? Also, again, there's no quotas for disciplines. They will fund research in all areas of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. there is one more question from audience. Can Indian apply for this fellowship? I, I think yes, of course. Yeah, the most important thing is to identify a suitable host. You know, there, there must be a, a common interest for the host and you and the research that can be developed together in Germany. This is very crucial. So I would say the first thing is to identify the place where you want to work. 
so the, does the place of selection or how strong the research area of uh, uh, the host is also being considered while uh, selecting the application or uh, it is only the applicant's uh, credentials are taken care of or uh, also the host's uh, credibility and uh, achievements are also considered absolutely uh, they will also look into the, the the host profile yeah and they will also check up if the host has conditions to really foster that research and if the institution agrees to the hosting and so forth, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Camargo. And uh, really, really, it is such a wonderful uh, you being here. And our audiences are saying wonderful presentation. Some of them are also asking, Nancy Onjomo Otiono is asking, can you share the presentation? So it is up to you if you would like to share or not. OK, I can send that to you later. And uh, I would really like to encourage, especially the female young scientists, to look into this opportunity. As I said, from my personal perspective, this was really a, a, a landmark in my career. You know, you, I, I think I grow, grew a lot through this experience and this opportunity. And I think sometimes people get a little shy to apply for this because they think, you know, it's too prestigious, too high level. But I would like to encourage our female scientists to explore this. Yeah, there are a lot of compliments for uh, uh, presenting such a wonderful opportunity to all of us. So thank you, Dr. Andrea. It is thank very you, nice you being here. Thank you so much. So dear friends, what a wonderful, fantastic productive these three days have been. We started with identifying the reasons of lack of women scientists in academia, research institutions. We also discussed various ways to bring into more women in science. We gathered an information on various national fellowships women can take and to improve her contribution at an international platform through international opportunities. And our speaker shared advisors, especially to the early career women scientists to believe in ourselves and believe in what we do matters that matters for science and society. And most importantly, creating the network and finding a peer support and mentoring is another key. Be open and outspoken about the challenges that you face and helping each other. And finally, we, we all have to decide that this is our life and we have to decide what things are worth fighting for and what others are not worth the time or energy. So I'm sure after all of these uh, days discussions, focusing directly on empowering women in science, we have gathered a lot of confidence and we all are ready to embark on a new exciting journey, which is full of amusement, success, ambitions, and many, many opportunities. With this now, I request Professor Mahanwar to sum up and present a vote of thanks for the day today. Professor Mahanwar. Uh, thank you, Shalini. Uh, it was a great uh, session today also. We had uh, three, day, three different sessions and I think uh, out of these all these three sessions, definitely we could have uh, we are able to encourage at least few uh, ladies to go for uh, various kind of uh, programs, schemes, fellowships available worldwide. Because many speakers are given what are the various opportunities available worldwide as well as in India. And I think one of the uh, uh, job which have been now assigned by Dr. Stecker Monday that we should uh, again organize such kind of uh, same webinar where we can have 50% partnership of, uh, I mean, uh, participation of men and women. I think that is what uh, now you have to do with your job and where definitely I'll support you. Professor Padma also will be there to support that. And we, we may get good support from uh, CSIR also for this particular thing. Uh, in and all, uh, I think all three days, all sessions are very good. We had very good speakers for all the three sessions who have shared their views, who have given some of the tips how to balance the uh, career and the family life for the women. 
and what are the ways out, how to come out of it. Today, uh, Dr. Maha mentioned about how to balance it very systematically, that you write down points what to, what to do for a day, for a week, for a month, and for a year. I think, I think that, that's how the, uh, the things can. And that's how uh, today we have very good uh, speakers uh, who have uh, given a uh, lot of information about how to balance the career and the family life as well as uh, Dr. Mande has mentioned, what are the opportunities available in the uh, in India for uh, young career women scientists? Andre, uh, Dr. Andre Kamrogo has given uh, what uh, uh, benefits or what kind of opportunities available uh, in Germany as well as in uh, uh, Brazil. I think uh, um, our participants definitely must be. Uh, benefited out of what three day sessions we had. And I thank all the speakers who accepted our invitations and spared the time, valuable time, and given a lot of information. I thank uh, specifically Professor M.M. Sharma, who has accepted our invitation as a chief guest, and he has given his own experiences during his uh, academic career at ICT. I thank uh, Professor Panma Devarajan for giving us encouragement in all the uh, three days as well as earlier two programs. I hope she can definitely again give us more and more courage and opportunity to organize this kind of uh, program. I thank Professor A.B. Pandit, our Vice Chancellor, who always stood behind uh, uh, all of us for uh, uh, organizing such kind of activities. And last but not the least, I think uh, even for last three days, we had maximum possible participants on YouTube as well as on uh, uh, Zoom. And uh, definitely all these efforts are definitely due to your own efforts which you put in. Uh, I hope uh, we can do this again and uh, again we can get many more people on the platform. Thank you, Kalini. Thank you once again. Kalini, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Mahanwar, and thank you all the speakers, audiences, Professor Padma for wonderful um, help and uh, everything. And I would like to announce that Dr. Shekhar Mande immediately has uh, connected me with uh, Atya Kapari, and very soon we will be announcing the next important uh, webinar that uh, very wherein men and women both will um, participate and I'm looking forward all of yours participation in that um, uh, webinar and uh, we will be in touch and uh, uh, before I end I would like to end uh, this this webinar with a very famous note of uh, Marie Curie. Uh, life is not easy for any of us but what of that? We must have perseverance and above all, confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing at whatever cost must be attained. And with this, I would like to say thank you all. Thank you too, Shalini. Yes. Thank, thank you, you to our speakers, Andrea and Maha. Thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate your presence and your talk. It was very nice, both your talks. Thank you, organizers. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. See you soon in the next webinar. Yes, Shalini, one word of caution. Please keep time for publicity. Don't rush the date. Keep the gap, please. <laughs> Bye, everyone.